First and foremost, I just got to say thank you all so much for being here. Uh, this means the world. We took on something different, and we made it happen. So appreciate you guys. Give yourselves a round of applause just for being in the building. Now, Ms. Opal, I've had the pleasure of speaking with you multiple times, interviewing you, all the things. And I just want to let you know how grateful I am to have you in the building with us again. So thank you, thank you, thank you. So I want to first start off with what a lot of us know you for, the grandmother of Juneteenth. When you hear folks say that, what does that mean to you nowadays? Let me say thank you to these young people. Young people, I want to say, and you do know you are all young people if you're not 96. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm so delighted to be interviewed by you again. <laughs> now, ask the question again. <laughs> Juneteenth, the grandmother of Juneteenth, Miss Opal, what does that mean to you? It means freedom. Mm -hmm. And I mean freedom for everybody. I'm not just talking about black people, um, Texas people. I'm talking about freedom for all of us. Mm -hmm. And none of us are free until we're all free. Yes, ma'am. When you talk about Juneteenth and you set out to march to Washington, D.C., your symbolic walk to march, march to Washington, D.C., what was that journey like for you when you finally got to sit alongside, stand alongside President Biden to sign Juneteenth into law? I don't know where to begin because you have to know all the people who were a part of my getting to that White House. Yeah. We took a million five hundred thousand signatures to Congress. And and we were prepared to take that many more mm -hmm. when I actually got to the White House. But I got to tell you, if we had three million signatures, if we had three million people on the same page, we could turn this country around. <laughs> and we need, it needs turning. Yeah. It does. Um, the White House, I enjoyed it. I was humble. But mm -hmm. to be there with the president and the vice president and all of those congressional people, I could have done a holy dance, but the kids <laughs> say when I try that, I'm twerking. So Um, oftentimes, then, part of the reason why it took so long to get Juneteenth passed as a federal holiday was a lot of people feel like Juneteenth is a complicated holiday. Why do you feel like some people think that Juneteenth is so complicated, so hard for others to understand? I don't know who they are. Ooh. <laughs> it is not complicated. Mm -hmm. Freedom is not complicated. And we had waited so long. We prayed at our churches, watch night services, mm -hmm. waiting for freedom to come. And when it did, we started celebrating, and we've been celebrating ever since. Oh, I know that's right. Yes. Look, we've been waiting for Juneteenth to get passed as a federal holiday for decades at mm -hmm. this point, right? Now that it's passed, you're working on another feat. That other feat is that Juneteenth Museum, the National Juneteenth Museum that will be in Fort Worth, Texas. Tell folks about that museum and how they can help out with that one. Ooh. <laughs> I thought she never asked. <laughs> Wait a minute, y'all. What you got? You got to know that it's a $70 million project. I had a young man come to me because I had been to the city asking for money for Juneteenth. It wasn't the city, it was some group downtown. And so they told me they didn't have money, and they sent this young man to me to kind of smooth it over, that perhaps they'd have some the next year. 
And he began to tell me about the things he wanted to do as soon as he found the land. I mean, he outlined that stuff to me. And I said, I got some land. <laughs> and we've been joined at the hip ever since. And if I can find it, I'm going to show you what it looks like. It's a $70 million project. And we've raised $40 million in Fort Worth. So when I come to you with my cup, don't you tell me you ain't got that. <laughs> now, I don't know if y'all caught that. She said they raised 40 million. They've only been trying to raise money for the last couple of years. That's a big deal to raise $40 million. So give a round of applause for that in a couple of years. <laughs> And the architects listened to the neighborhood when the people said they didn't want any tall buildings in their neighborhood. And this is reminiscent of a shotgun house. I don't know if any of you know, know what shotgun, shotgun house. house is. But these are the porches on the shotgun house. And this is going to be a $70 million project. Don't have me dancing up here. <laughs> You can do whatever dance you want, Miss Opal, <laughs> trust me. So, Miss Opal, obviously you wrote a, a book here. You have a copy of your book as well. Um, with books being taken out of schools these days, the fact that we can at least still talk about Juneteenth, what do you want folks to take away from that Juneteenth book, A Children's Story? I want them to understand that we must tell the children what's happened. Mm -hmm. Good, bad, ugly. We can't leave out our history. And that means you are going to have to go vote for people who are on our side. Yes. You hear? You've got to vote. You've got to go to the school board meetings. I know they can be boring as hell, but <laughs> <laughs> so you got to you got to you got to get on the school book committee. You can't sit back and let somebody else dictate to us, dictate to us what they want us to have. We have to make decisions for ourselves. And when they start taking books out of the school, that's the time for you to protest because we need them to know exactly what happened so it doesn't happen again. There you go. And it can. There you go. So you talk about Juneteenth and making sure that everyone is well aware that this has happened. From a freedom standpoint, what, what you said freedom earlier, but what else does Juneteenth mean for you? Why has this been so important to you that it became your life's work? I don't know how else to say it, except none of us are free until we're all free. Mm -hmm. And the yeah. fact that there are jobless people and homeless people and people who can't get health care, some of us can and some of us can't, and climate change that we are responsible for. And if we don't do something about it, we all go into hell in a handbasket. Mm. So it's left up to us. Don't leave it to somebody else. But see that the young people know the tech stuff. We don't have guns, but we got some sharp minds. Mm -hmm. So let's use them. And, and again, I'll say, three million people can turn this country around. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, we had a young person speaking of, her name was Carrington Bennett. She was on stage earlier this evening. Um, she had on a yellow suit and she talked about food deserts, mm -hmm. right? It's an area of work that I don't know that a lot of people know that you've been doing for years. You have Miss Opal's farm. Talk about that farm and what y'all are trying to do to enhance the work that you're doing for food deserts. Well, I'll have to tell you this first, that I was associated with a food bank that burned and there's this huge complex behind my house. And I asked, and they gave us the use of it. They leased it to us for $4,000 a month. We paid it for 11 months. And the month we didn't have it, those people came to us and said, we are aware that you are servicing some 500 families a day. 
Mm. And we felt like you're doing a good job. And they gave us this $1.3 wow. million dollar building. Do you Woo! hear me? And so people standing in line, I polled them. Anybody here want to farm? And 66 people said they were willing to farm. Here I go again to the Tarrant Water District Board. And they gave us the use of 13 acres of land on the river. And we've got about five under cultivation. We are trying to institute a program mm -hmm. where the 66 people who told me they wanted to farm, we chose to work with those who'd been incarcerated yep. and can't find a job. Mm -hmm. And so what we had in mind is if they go through our program, Tarleton State is willing to give them certification and the time they serve is not time lost because they've been on the farm here. There you go. So if you know anybody in Australia, there's a city block that we want and need because we need housing for these people. We need to have a place for processing the vegetables and things, the produce we get. Our food, um, I mean, Joel, who's the uh, farm manager, he shares produce with the food bank and the WIC program, wow. and then he goes to market. Mm. And he, we've had produce. I mean, I go down there, the tomatoes, oh, I don't want to exaggerate. I just wipe one off and start eating. <laughs> there, he's raising peppers and peas and all kinds of things. And then there are specialty cafes that have him raising the herbs and stuff mm -hmm. that they use in the cafe. Mm -hmm. I tell you. <sighs> <laughs> Uh, this is my last question for you, Ms. Opal. For the young people, young, old, seasoned, in between, what advice do you have for all of us to just keep fighting and keep pushing forward even when it seems like the odds are stacked against us? What advice do you have for us? I want each one of you to make yourself a committee of one to change somebody's mind, change their minds. It's going to take more than a day. You're going to have to work at it. But if people have been taught to hate, they can be taught to love. Yeah. And it's up to you to do it. And can't you see a world ooh, where we don't have the gun violence and mm -hmm. all these kinds of things because you have changed somebody's mind. It's not left up to the churches. Lord knows they got plenty to do, but make it your business to change somebody's mind. Okay, I hope I'm gonna change that speaker mind in a minute. Y'all give it up for Miss Opal Lee.